multiple smugglers. This amateur video was shot secretly behind the Iron Curtain. A nice Berliner wants to escape to the West. The organization helping him has decided that it's easier to falsify his face than his passport. In eight hours time, Peter Meyer, a white East German railway worker, will try to cross the border as an African student. The Berlin Wall is 25 years old this weekend. 77 people have lost their lives trying to cross it. But many more have made it, some thanks to their own initiative and bravery, others because of an industry that was born the moment the first bricks were laid, the escape industry. This film is the story of two of the men who organized some of the most audacious escapes in the history of the wall, and one of them is still doing it. This is one of the most successful escape tunnels ever built beneath the Berlin Wall. 20 feet underground, East Berliners crawled to the west through a tunnel more than 150 yards long. The tunnel was conceived by a West Berliner called Wolfgang Fox. Between 1961 and 1973, Wolfgang Fox was one of Berlin's leading escape organizers. Most of the people he brought out were through tunnels like this. That was the best moment for me, when the people came crawling out the tunnel from East Berlin on their knees, like mice. And the marks on the floor of the tunnel, like ripples in the sand, it was their knee prints. That for me was a beautiful sight. It doesn't matter what becomes of me, I will never forget that sight. That was happiness. Happiness is also Beethoven, Mozart and Schubert, but that to me was human happiness. The Berlin Wall itself was a direct consequence of the way in which Germany was split up after the Second World War. The country was divided into four zones, each occupied and controlled by one of the Allied countries. Berlin would also be divided, even though it lay deep in the Soviet zone. Russia put up with that, but not for long. Three years after the war, in the Berlin blockade when the Soviets cut off all road, rail and waterway links between Berlin and the West. The Allies responded with a Berlin airlift. Every minute of the day and night, planes ferried essential supplies to beleaguered West Berlin. After 11 months, Russia, fearing the consequences of escalation, backed down and called off the blockade. In 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany was formed out of the Allied zones in the West. The Russians responded with the German Democratic Republic in the East. And while the West received aid under the Marshall Plan, East Germany and East Berlin enjoyed the doubtful benefits of Stalinism. The dispossessed and the disaffected began to pack their bags. In 1953, work rotors in East Berlin were increased. Construction workers protested, and the Red Army was called in to suppress what they feared was an uprising. They killed an estimated 400 people. From that moment on, the numbers of refugees increased sharply. The drain on the east was appalling. Between 1949 and 1961, when the war went up, two and three quarter million people, a fifth of the population of East Germany, fled to the west, mainly through Berlin. And the people these West Berlin refugee camps were feeding and sheltering were, as often as not, the bedrock of East Germany's future. The young and skilled, the doctors, teachers, engineers. East Germany and Russia were desperate. The flow seemed unstoppable. Cameraman Helmut Sontag. It was an excitement uh, atmosphere in the, uh, in the t in town. Everybody knew that something would happen. For refugees came uh, till to 10,000 a day and uh, they were flown out by uh, aeroplane to West Germany. So uh, all the atmosphere in town was very excitement and we didn't know what to do. In May 1961, 17,000 refugees. In June, 20,000. In July, more than 30,000. And in August, East Germany put a stop to it. The wall went up.
The date was August the 13th, 1961, four o'clock on a Sunday morning. Throughout the entire length of the city, East German troops piled from their lorries, uncoiled their barbed wire, slapped mortar between their concrete blocks and stood guard over their work. It was uh, in uh, Saturday at uh, the 12th of August and we had, we had a party there, we had a birthday party and uh, it was a little bit loud and a little bit long and uh, suddenly one of my guests who was a minister for all German affairs, Minister Lemmer, he got a ring and uh, my police was called. Um, the uh, Brandenburg gate is uh, blocked. No people can go out. And uh, at the same moment I heard this and said, oh, my, that might be very interesting. And I called up uh, immediately my crew and we were immediately, immediately filming all about what was necessary. 25 years on, the wall at first sight is no less startling, though it is more sophisticated. The rounded top is to prevent grappling hooks finding purchase. There's a so-called death strip between the two sections of wall. There are watchtowers, electrified fences, detection equipment, foot patrols. Yet in the city center, Many West Berliners appear unconcerned by the wall, especially the young. Today it's a tourist attraction, and on a summer's day, even the political graffiti conspires by its color and craft to mask the real bleakness beneath. Five years ago, it was very different. Few East Berliners then doubted the awful implications of the war, and while it was still largely barbed wire, escapes were spontaneous and instinctive even by the guards. Many houses were in the east, while the pavements outside were in the west. The only way out for some was to jump. Gradually, however, windows were bricked up, breeze blocks replaced the barbed wire, the wall was strengthened. The escape became more difficult and more risky. The killing began. And no killing caused more revulsion than that of Peter Fechter, the cruelty of whose death seemed scarcely believable, even to those millions of people around the world who saw it on television the next day. Peter Fechter, a 19-year-old student from East Berlin, bled to death at the foot of the wall after border guards had shot him trying to climb over it. For nearly an hour he lay unattended, despite his agonized cries for help. When they finally came for him, he was dead. The Fechter shooting may have frightened off a lot of would-be escapers, but it also reinforced the resolve of others, and it sharpened their ingenuity. One man got out by attaching himself to a funeral cortege passing through Checkpoint Charlie. This bubble car made a number of successful trips from the east, with each time an escaper curled up in the space where the petrol tank used to be. The bubble car's newly adapted tank could hold barely enough petrol to make it across the border and back again. To men like Wolfgang Fuchs, who, when the wall first went up, had taken out friends and relatives from the east in the boot of his car, these examples showed that a professional approach to escaping was the way forward. He too was studying the wall closely for any weakness. The first possibility we looked at was the sewerage system which ran between east and west to see if we could still get through. But by then it was too late. They had already blocked it off with grids and installed alarm systems. Next we tried uh, not false passports, but passports which looked very similar to get people out. And we'd actually got the passes. But then the East Germans introduced special stamps. They had duplicate passes 
and kept one copy at the checkpoint so that when you came out with your pass, they checked the duplicate. Of course, there was no way we could get our fakes into their duplicate system. So in the end, we tried to find a simple, brutal way of actually getting people over the wall. This is Liesenstrasse. The Berlin Wall runs along it. And on the west side, there's a block of flats, which 21 years ago played a key role in the escape of a young East Berliner called Jürgen Kummer. Facing that block in the east is a cemetery, which in 1965 went right the way up to the wall. There were gates there then, forming part of the wall, reinforced by barbed wire. We found a place here. 200 meters away down there stood the cemetery chapel. Behind it was a watchtower, but because of the building, there was a blind spot where the guards couldn't see the wall. So Jürgen would come out over the cemetery gates. He had a good reason to be in the cemetery. His grandmother was buried there. But he still needed special permission to visit her grave, which a priest connected to the Fuchs organization arranged with the authorities. After we'd found the blind spot, we needed somewhere where we could watch what was happening on the other side of the wall. So up there on the fourth floor, we found an empty flat and rented it for six months. And from the flat, we were able to check everything about the guards when the patrols came along, when they changed shifts, any hidden dangers. At 3.30 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon in mid-October, Wolfgang Fuchs and his men drove in a rented truck to Liesenstrasse. Concealed in the block of flats, there to record the event, was cameraman Helmut Sontag, scanning the cemetery for the arrival of their escaper. We saw him there at the, um, the Angel, and we gave a sign to, uh, to the uh, refugee helpers, and uh, immediately the car came, and he had a, a water can and walked very slowly around the graves. On the other side of the wall, there was about five or six meters of barbed wire to stop people approaching the wall. So we built a special hinged ladder to get over this. We drove the lorry in. We rehearsed it a dozen of times, of course. The ladder went over and the man came running, dropping everything, flowers and water and can. We grabbed him. In a matter of seconds, it was all over. After Jürgen Kummer's escape, embarrassed East German authorities dug up the graves of people buried near the wall, moved their coffins elsewhere, and closed off the area. No one would go visiting quite so close to the wall again. But even while planning Jürgen Kummer's escape, Fuchs was already working on other methods. Instead of going over the wall, he would go under. Getting people over the top didn't work anymore. It never really worked. And you could only get one or two people out at a time. It was a risky business. Tunnels were risky as well. But in the end, there was no other choice. In the space of four years in the mid-60s, Fuchs and his organization dug seven tunnels and brought out over 200 people. Many of those who helped dig these tunnels were mining students at the Free University of Berlin, where Fuchs himself had once studied. But tunneling under the Berlin Wall presented obvious problems. You needed the right place to start in the west and a safe place to come up in the east. In the west, you needed enough space for the earth from the tunnel. You needed electricity, you needed a place where nobody could hear you, where you could get your people in and out without attracting attention. In the east, you needed somewhere where you could break through and where you could assemble your escapers without being seen. 
it was an atmosphere like a, uh, like a, like a spy or like a, like somebody who couldn't speak. You couldn't even speak to your wife. You couldn't speak to nobody. Uh, uh, we always said, well, we have an assignment. And then we went there, went down into town. I said, we have an assignment for approximately a week. And my wife said, uh, where you are going? Going, you are going West Germany or you going abroad? No, I said, we are staying in Berlin. But uh, then she knew what was happening, but she doesn't knew where it was. Tunnels were the most expensive form of escape in terms of money and manpower. Then again, there was no telling how many people you might be able to get out. Fuchs's most ambitious effort freed 57 people. The several thousands of pounds the tunnel cost came from individual donations, anti-communist organizations and newsmen. Sometimes, of course, we had to stop for a couple of weeks because we ran out of equipment or money. But then somebody would always come along and say, OK, boys, if you need something, I'll let you have it. For example, our minibus, we didn't have to buy it. It was given to us. It was secondhand, of course. We didn't need a new one. But that's really how we kept going. In the world of freedom, the proudest boast is, Ich bin ein Berliner. Yet despite the most powerful leaders in the world declaring their solidarity with West Berlin, despite West Berlin almost reveling in its role as an oasis of freedom, the authorities' attitude towards Fuchs and men like him was ambivalent. They put up with him, but it was an understanding that no one could count on. Wolfgang Fuchs. At the best, we were tolerated and that very often on a private basis. An individual police officer would say, OK, I'll cover that for you, but officially, never. Despite the proximity of its watchtowers and prying eyes, Fuchs's tunnels were dug close to the wall. Officially, no trace of these tunnels remains now because all the buildings that house them have been demolished. Unofficially, this may not be the case. From this cellar, we were told, a tunnel once ran to the Soviet sector. But as the wall became more secure, so the tunnels became longer and more difficult. When the tunnel was only 20 meters long, you could dig it with just three people. You didn't have the problems of ventilation. There was no difficulty with the earth you were digging out. The real problem started when East Berlin introduced a 100-meter restricted area on the other side of the wall. Anybody who wanted to enter this area needed a permit, but of course, the sort of person who wanted to escape wouldn't get a permit. So we had to dig under the restricted area as well, and that was when the problems really began, because as the tunnel gets longer, the logistics get very complicated indeed. Wolfgang Fuchs told us that seldom in his life had he been so happy as when he was digging his tunnels, despite the very real dangers involved. <laughs> Breaking through in the east, that was the most important moment. Only then did you know for certain that the state security people on the other side hadn't discovered the operation because they don't mess around. They don't say hello, hands up. They just open fire as soon as your head pops out. When the breakthrough to the east had been made, the courier in the east would keep a watch on it for 24 hours to make sure it wasn't discovered. Then he and other members of the organization would round up the waiting escapers and take them to an assembly point. They were told to wear their best clothes to fool the police. It was a subterfuge. Nobody would wear their best clothes to go crawling underground. And then they came through. That, for me, was the best moment. When the people came crawling out of the tunnel from East Berlin on their knees, like mice. And the marks on the floor of the tunnel, like ripples in the sand, it was their knee prints. That, for me, was a beautiful sight. It doesn't matter what becomes of me, I will never forget that sight. That was happiness. Not everyone who sought freedom went to an escape helper. 
Philip Hewitt, now an English language translator in West Germany, used his own considerable ingenuity to get his East German girlfriend, Ilse, out. Philip and Ilse met 21 years ago when Philip was part of a church youth team helping to rebuild bomb-scarred Dresden. The couple fell in love, realized they would never get permission to marry and therefore leave together, so Philip decided he would forge a British passport that indicated they were already married. He stole his parents' passport, which was lying unused in a drawer in their home at Thornton Heath in Surrey. The passport would now have to show photographs of Philip and Ilse, which meant he would have to remove the photographs of his parents. The photographs could be, in those days, levered off the paper, and the British Foreign Office seal was an embossed seal. This could be fairly well forged if you had a steady hand. And the details on a passport in the old days, you had to fill them in yourself when you applied for the passport. I took the photographs of myself and Ilse, which I'd uh, done on very thin paper, and I put them on the reverse of the page where the original photos, they were on the front, and I put the new photos on the back, and I traced it through from the back. The plan was to meet in East Berlin, catch a train to Czechoslovakia, and cross the border with Austria as Mr. and Mrs. Hewitt. Unfortunately for Philip and Ilse, they couldn't begin their journey as Mr. and Mrs. Hewitt, because when Philip entered East Berlin through Checkpoint Charlie, the border guard stamped his false passport in German, Mr. Hewitt traveling alone. As their train thundered south through East Germany, Philip and Ilse pretended not to know each other. She on her legitimate East German passport, Philip with his forged British one. It was very, very traumatic. There were hardly any seats. We had to sit in separate compartments. And I put Ilse into one compartment where there were five Czechs sitting, Czech citizens. And I went and sat in the next compartment all on my own. At the East German border with Czechoslovakia, there would be two passport inspections from the East German guards and the Czechs. For the East Germans, Ilse would show her legitimate GDR passport. The plan was that there would be time before the Czech inspection for Philip to join Ilse in her compartment, and they would become Mr. and Mrs. Hewitt. I'd just shown my papers to the East German border guards. They'd left the compartment. I gave them 10 seconds to get down the corridor a bit, and then I came out, and lo and behold, the Czechs were coming from the opposite direction, which I hadn't counted on at all. Ilse, who even today doesn't want to be recognized because she still has relatives in the East, describes how she felt. It was the most critical point when the Czech uh, arrived earlier than we thought, and I didn't know what to, to do. Shall I wait? Shall I look out of the window? Uh, I couldn't speak any English. My English is still bad, but at this time it wasn't there at all, you see. I rushed to the door just as they were about to go in, and rather pushing myself forward, I said, this is me, and this is my wife in there, and these are our papers, and uh, hoped that nobody would notice that uh, a double take was happening, that Ilse had presented one travel document to the East Germans and was now prepared to go along as my wife on a separate set of travel documents. Ilse was terrified, less of the guards than of the five Czech passengers sharing her compartment. At least one, I thought, well, he watched you, and he must have known uh, or seen you uh, just being an East German citizen and then becoming a West Ger um, English citizen. It can't be done. Nobody said a word. And uh, I have res respect the Czechs ever since for that genuine gesture of solidarity, as I feel it must have been, because any one of those five could have said, excuse me, in Czech, which I wouldn't have been able to understand, there's something wrong here. At about 9 p.m. on the 29th of December, 1966, Philip and Ilse crossed the border from Czechoslovakia into Austria. They spent their first few days together in the West, in Vienna, where these pictures were taken. Berlin, 1964. Wolfgang Fuchs was becoming an embarrassment to his own side. Delicate negotiations between East and West were going on to open the wall for Christmas visits. And Fuchs' high-profile activities were seen as a threat to those talks. 
The worst moment was with the last tunnel but one. The secret police knew of it, but we didn't know this. It was 140 meters long, it had taken 38 people to dig it, and it cost 100,000 Deutschmarks. We were about to go through the tunnel into East Berlin to do the final test. We had a scarecrow that looked almost lifelike, and we'd stick it up so that if they were waiting, they would shoot its head off, just like William Tell. We were getting ready to do this when the East Berliners threw a bomb into the tunnel. It was so powerful that even in the cellar in the west we were blown over like flies. If we'd been in the tunnel at that moment, our lungs would have burst and I'd be up in heaven now. Fuchs never discovered how the East German police knew the existence of that tunnel, but he suspects he was betrayed. In 1965, just a year after that incident, he ran foul of the West Berlin authorities again. His audacious plan this time was to position a crane right next to the wall, lift a bulletproof container over it, pick up six escapees and haul them back to the West. The West Berlin police knew about this operation, but suddenly for political reasons I was told quite clearly to stop. Of course we didn't let that worry us and carried on. We'd built a false section of wall where we had a crane driver who practiced swinging the container over the wall and back again. We used to time him with a stopwatch. You didn't have hours to do it in. And then they took away our crane. Our own West Berlin police stole our crane on the grounds that it was in a no parking area. I'm not blind. I knew it was politics. But for the following eight years, Fuchs continued to defy the authorities on both sides of the divide by moving away from tunnel escapes and instead concentrating on cars with false compartments, operating away from Berlin and along the borders of several Eastern Bloc countries where security was not so tight. He retired in 1973 a full 12 years after he'd helped his first escaper out. By that time, the escape industry was big business. In June 1979, Pope John Paul II returned to his native Poland. When he left, his entourage numbered six more priests and two more nuns than had entered the country with him. These were not men and women of the cloth, and the Vatican knew nothing of their existence. They were escapers, traveling on false passports, but relying also on the supposition that if they looked the part, they and their documents would be scrutinized less closely. The man who organized that escape is West Berliner Wolf Kwasner. One of Kwasner's recent stunts involving dummies dressed as Russian officers was, he now admits, nothing more than a stunt. But it's undoubtedly true that he has been responsible for very real escapes. His strength is forgery. He once worked in magazine printing. Printing was not so important. It was the mark to put inside in a passport, changing the photos and make a new Mark inside. This is part of the process of forging a passport, the science in which Krasner's organization excels. The stamps that go in these passports are as vital as the documents themselves. Under normal inspection, a stamp may appear to be one color or a set of colors. But as this reconstruction shows, under ultraviolet light, these may well appear different. Krasner's stamps, therefore, must not only match the apparent colors of a genuine stamp, but its secret colors as well. Wolf Kwasner's organization depends on a system of couriers, one to make contact with the escapers, another to give them their false documents and passports, sometimes a third to escort them by train or plane to the border. Dieter Bergner was one of Kwasner's most successful operators. In his time, he's been every kind of courier there is. But how it all felt, what kept him going, he finds hard to talk about. Well, it's a feeling you simply cannot describe. 
mixture of hope uh, that it will succeed and fear. The fear that one has uh, for oneself and the fear that uh, one has for the escapers. <laughs> you just can't disguise it. Either you do it or you don't. Today, Dieter Bergner runs a bar in West Berlin. On the walls, the forgeries, the stamps, the mementos of a 10-year career in which he made over 30 runs behind the Iron Curtain and helped bring out more than 100 people. First of all, you make contact with the people who want to escape. And then you give them the forged papers and you tell them what to do. If someone is going to use a diplomatic passport, I always say to him, you're a diplomat now, don't grovel. Act as if you are a diplomat. Then you bring the people to the train and you keep an eye on them to the frontier. Every escaper had his own way of reacting to freedom. Dieter Bergner, as the man who shadowed so many of them to the West, witnessed a range of emotions. There were all sorts of different reactions. I've seen people in fits of laughter. Their nerves were in such a state, they just couldn't stop. I've seen people who had crying fits. Others who they just stood there with the, with the tears rolling down their cheeks. Some people, they just couldn't show any reaction at all. The nurse was so tense, they just couldn't show any reaction. I, I suppose it was because they knew what would have happened to them if they had been caught. Father, mother in prison, child in a home, <laughs> unless it was old enough to be sent to a relative, if they were prepared to take it. But I myself couldn't show anything, because I couldn't reveal myself. I just had to slip discreetly away. Border guards changed their techniques abruptly and often. Escape organizers had to react quickly. These Germans began changing their visas and passport stamps sometimes daily. It meant that passports now had to be forged behind the Iron Curtain because only then did the courier know what the latest stamp was. So Krasner's men had to be able to work in confined spaces, such as the toilet compartment on a train, transferring the stamp from a legitimate passport to a false one. And often, the man or woman the courier was to bring out would be sitting in a compartment just down the corridor. The first thing he is doing, he makes his face full of shaving cream in case police or controller is coming and they only see all the normal things inside. Now he puts the special film on the mark in his passport, on the original mark. And on this he puts a special ultraviolet filter to have a distance to the film. He puts a normal plast box. But it takes now about 10 minutes that the light destroys in a reflection the white parts from the paper. The soap box, two parts of the soap box, he puts the chemicals inside, puts the film in the first chemical, and three minutes later he has a negative. He dries the film with a towel very quickly and then puts the film on a special plastic material. In the same way again with the flashlight, plastic box and the filter, 10 minutes again. The plastic who gets the light is very hard 
and the other plastic goes with water and the brush and three minutes later he has a same mark like the police used 30 minutes ago. Krasner said he was showing us these techniques because the East is aware of them now, he doesn't use them anymore. Once upon a time, Krasner and his men could count on a little help, however discreet, from the West German authorities. But as other escape organizers discovered before him, what little they gave, they took away. And now? Absolute kind of Absolutely none anymore. 10, 20 years ago, there was some political help. Now, we not only have to protect ourselves from uh, the secret police of the eastern countries, but against our own as well. The first time we make the passports, we get help from some uh, officers here in the West. And uh, later on, they didn't help, but uh, they accept, yes. And uh, after 1980, it was forbidden to do this, to print passports and to make the wrong stamps inside. In April 1984, Dieter Bergner slipped out of Berlin into the east. He was to escort a Polish family to the west. It would prove to be his last run. We had an order from one person in West Germany. And this person told us that one very important doctor from a little village, East Germany, that he likes to go to the west to escape with his family. We check everything up. We check everything out first, what these people are, what they do, whether what they've told us is the truth. But there's nothing you can do if somebody is cooperating with the secret police. And you've had it. Dieter went in these international hotels. He knows this hotel very well. Many times he was there. And then he saw the family waiting, alone in a lobby. The doctor, the wife, the kind. And Dita was sitting down next chair, reading the newspaper, watching these three people. But they are no normal family. Nothing is wrong. No police in, is around. Not secret police. And I have then a family. I made contact with the family. Father, mother, and child uh, in the hotel reception. Then the man raised his finger, and that was it. Eight policemen all around me. There was nothing I could do. Dieter Bergner faced 15 years in prison. The Poles, however, seemed less hostile than the East Germans, and the country needed hard currency, however small the amount. He was bailed for $15,000, which Wolf Krasner paid, and allowed back to the West. He never received a summons to return. However unnatural and offensive the Berlin Wall may seem to us in the West, from an East German point of view, it was the only solution to a problem which was destabilizing their country so seriously as to make it very soon ungovernable. Such human and intellectual resources as they possessed were leaving in vast numbers, and the cost of their going was often paid unwittingly by those who were left behind. As Wolf Krasner himself became aware, the natural assumption that we might have in the West, that every escape is a small triumph for humanity, was not always true. I think today my thinking about the wall is different to the old time. In 79 to 82, I brought out many doctors and uh, families. I could get some information from the person that I heard Ah, yes, I was a doctor in a small village called Gera or something like this. And uh, two weeks later, we get the other family. Yes, he was a doctor, too, from Gera. And then I think, oh, Gera is not so a big uh, village. It's not so big. One doctor is going, next doctor is going. And then we get the third doctor from Gera. And then I was thinking about it. What has happened with the person? They need help from the doctor. So that is the reason now I changed a little bit my thinking about all these things. 
Du bist pünktlich, das weiß ich. 14 Uhr, 14.30 Uhr im Restaurant. Not all escape organizers are as sensitive as Quasner. Having said that, he's no angel. But he doesn't cheat refugees, and to some, they're fair game. Peter Meyer, a railway worker, his wife Hanny, and their three-year-old son Marcus lived in East Berlin. They wanted to escape, and via an intermediary in the West, they made contact with an escape organizer. They handed over 6,000 pounds and were told to travel to Czechoslovakia, to wait beneath the statue in Wenceslas Square, Prague, where they'd be contacted again. They had to be there at eight o'clock on the evening of Friday the 13th of April, 1984. We were all excited, uh, nervous. We got to the square early at half past seven and waited. Eight o'clock came, then 8.30, nine o'clock. Then we knew that nothing was going to happen. We were totally dejected. We didn't know what to do. We knew we couldn't go back. We really didn't know what to do. They'd been conned. They went to this hotel and put their son to bed. Then Peter went to the bar and told his story to the first man he met. To Peter's astonishing good fortune, the man was a friend of Wolf Quasner's. What happened in the next five days at the Hotel Flora in Prague illustrates both the complexity and the ingenuity of Wolf Quasner's operation. We could help the woman because we already had some things finished for one woman, almost the age, and for a little child. And uh, next day, we sent a courier to that hotel to get the family. And the courier told the family, it is possible to get out a part of you. And the man has to wait, maybe a week. We don't know. At first, we decided we didn't want to do it. We said, either everybody together or none at all. Then I said, look, we've got this far, you go then. And then he took a photograph of my wife and went into the bathroom for about half an hour. And uh, when he came out, he showed us a passport with all the stamps and everything in it. And my wife's photo, all ready. It was hard to say goodbye. We didn't know what was going to happen. Peter Meyer had no choice but to trust the Quasner organization. Two days later, another courier made contact and showed him this photograph of his wife and son safe in West Berlin. But in West Berlin, Wolf Quasner had a problem. There wasn't time to forge a passport, so he needed a double whose passport Peter could use. We couldn't find a person for the father. That is very, that is very bad. The part of the family is, is uh, here in uh, freedom and the other one is waiting and sitting what's happened there. And uh, after some days, we found a person, this person says, yes, I will be the double. But it was uh, very difficult too, then this person was a Ghanaian, very black. But maybe the idea is good. However preposterous it might sound, to turn a white East Berlin railwayman into a black, completely plausible Ghanaian student, that's what Krasner meant to do. It was the first time not to change the passports, to change the face. I was very sure it works. If a black man is coming to the East Germans and he has a real passport with the real marks inside, nothing is false, only the face. Nobody will expect it. They see a black, ah yes, he can go. On the 19th of April, Wolf Quasner's team left for Prague. The next morning, Peter Meyer went down to breakfast. 
As yet, he had no idea what they were going to try and do. I sat down at the table and ordered breakfast, coffee. There were two black men sitting there. I thought, Kinder, have the secret police started recruiting people from Cuba now? <laughs> <laughs> I was a bit worried. They were looking at me as, as if they could see right through me, if, if they were on to me. Peter Meyer was now so distracted by the men he thought were Cubans, he didn't notice another couple sitting closer to him. A man and a woman on the next table said, um, Honey sends her love. And while I was still thinking about it, he said, um, Everything is ready, let's go upstairs. Peter Meyer quickly forgot the Cubans. Relief flooded through him. At last, the escape organizers had made contact. When they got to his room, the woman said they'd have to make some changes to his appearance. Before she could explain further, they were disturbed. There was a knock on the door, and there stood the two black men. I thought, this is the end. They've come to arrest me. And they were in the room, and it came out that one of them would be my escort. And the man I was with said, look at that gentleman there. He also had a beard and was a bit overweight. And he said, that's what you're going to look like. <laughs> and I said, that's, that's impossible. Do you, do you want to uh, put some boot on my face? And he said, no, it is possible. The girl had a case with her. She opened it up. Inside there were lots of bottles and tubes and things. And and she said, um, we'll change you now, and tonight you'll be in West Berlin. This is an amateur video of what happened in that room that day. At midday, Peter left the hotel for Prague Airport to fly to East Berlin. At his side was a Ghanaian courier. Now he looked the part but he certainly didn't feel it. That was terrible, terrible. I thought that everyone was looking at me, what they would be thinking, what's he up to? Why has he made himself up like that? But nothing happened. Everyone looked at me perfectly normally. At the airport, uh, I don't mind admitting, I, I got worried again. I thought, they must notice, but I just handed in my passport and they stamped it. My escort made me feel very safe. He was always at my side. If I'd had to do it alone, I, uh, I don't know whether I would have managed it. He gave me the confidence. One hour after leaving Prague, Peter Meyer and his courier flew into Schoenfeld Airport in East Berlin. An hour after that, he entered the train station at Friedrichstrasse to join the S-Bahn connecting the two halves of the city. At Friedrichstrasse, we had to go into a large hall where there was the first passport control. They just looked. Then at the second control, there was a hut and you just pushed your passport in there and they stamped it. And the door opened and I was outside. The train from Friedrichstrasse in the east to Lehrte Bahnhof in the west takes just three minutes. At six o'clock on the 20th of April, 1984, Peter Meyer arrived in West Berlin. His wife and son were waiting for him. On the 25th anniversary of the Berlin Wall, Wolf Quasner calculates he's brought more than a thousand people from the east. It's a remarkable achievement, considering the power and sophistication of the forces ranged against him and sometimes that disturbs him. At the 1st of May, 
I look at the television and I see the big parade in Moscow and I see the big parade in East Germany and then I go smaller and smaller and I say to myself, oh God, you are stupid. You are against these people, but these people against you. I know they are bigger and they have the power.